But I think that what we're doing right now is laying the foundation for the next generation to actually enhance normal humans. And the reason I think it's important to do that is because, I don't know if you know Ray Kurzweil, who's predicted that you know, machine intelligence will be at least equal and probably surpass human intelligence by 2045, which is a generation away. So we have to hurry up and enhance human intelligence or we'll be surpassed by the machines. And that to me is really the long-term view of what, in the big sense, brain-computer interfacing is about. You can call it building prosthetics, human enhancement, but or brain-machine interfacing. That's really what we're doing here. That's what we're laying the foundation for the future generation to enhance the human brain. I don't think that one should lay out a firm pathway because as you do research, you find out things serendipitously, and you say, oh, I better check this out. And you must allow for that uh, chaos and that um, irregular pattern of development. And you must allow people to be sidetracked. I don't think anybody should lay out a firm pathway. Now, I know that's contrary to the way we get grants, because we lay out a nice firm pathway, the next three years we're going to do this, next five years we'll do that, and it all looks rosy. That's not the way it works, you know that. It never works like that. And it's really the, the like, the sort of observation that is like, oops, that shouldn't have happened that way. Let, but let's not ignore it. Let's track that one down. And then the granting agent says, oh, you, you know, kind of you didn't do the right, you didn't do what you said you would do. But in fact, you made a great discovery. And I also think that it's important for individuals to be allowed a free hand to make discoveries. I think that's just <clears throat> put some of the, allocate some, you know, the wealth of the nation to a small extent to research like this, to let it lead itself forward and be sort of follow its nose sort of path instead of trying to make, but at the same time having a very distinct um, goal in mind, which is to develop a certain prosthetic. In my case, it's like, you know, speech prosthetic. So that's the goal. I want to have a speech prosthetic so people can speak at normal rate and perhaps just a hundred useful words, maybe several hundred useful words. So you have that goal in mind, but how we achieve there is kind of like a, a river delta. The river will flow every which way until it finally gets to its goal. You have to have a way of judging people's progress, whether they're making progress, but it shouldn't be judged on what they say they will do, it should be judged on what they actually did, even though it doesn't actually uh, agree with what they said they could do. Um, because like I said, I was just saying a moment ago, uh, uh, experimentation and research and findings come in a sort of chaotic manner, and that should be allowed to happen. Um, and I think it, it's actually really important to fund this area because it's laying the foundation for us to enhance human brains later on. There was a, <clears throat> I remember that, that writer, I'll think of his name in a moment, he's wheelchair bound, and 10 years ago he wrote an article about the tail wagging the dog. Well, the dog is the whole human population. The tail, he, the analogy was the tail was people who are physically challenged in some way that they need some sort of device that will help them, whether it was his wheelchair they was in, or a BCI or a prosthetic of some kind. And <clears throat> uh, he said once the device are developed for those people who need them, it will turn around and the device will be used for people who don't actually need them. So in that sense, the tail will wag the dog. For non-invasives, in a sense it's already there, the gaming community, um, and I guess toys for kids where have this like um, device they put on the head and they tell you they're picking up EEG and maybe you are, maybe EMG or eye movements. So there's sort of a fun component to it I, I think that's going to take off in that direction. And the non-invasives, um, uh, other than um, doing it for fun and entertainment, perhaps the more serious gamers would use it, but they might even like to be implanted so that they would gain uh, 20 millisecond advantage over their, their adversary that they're gaming against. And 20 milliseconds isn't a long time, but it may be the difference between winning and losing. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't do that, but some people might.
when you're talking in a group, uh, maybe just hanging around the lab and you've got some questions, you're chatting, you, you instantly get the information. You can go on Google or Wikipedia and find out information real fast. Okay, so it might take a few minutes. But you don't have to run down to the library to pick up a book to get the information. It's much quicker. And you have tremendous calculation ability in computers and a simple $10 calculator, right? And you have your cell phone where you can uh, call up somebody and say, okay, you know, and quickly you can get it figured out. You can even do lots of more things, like you can confirm your flight home and, and get your boarding card. So there are a lot of things you can do with the cell phone, with the memory banks that are, the information memory banks that are stored in, in, um, in computers and <clears throat> with the calculation ability. Now imagine if somebody had all that in their brain. They had access to cloud computing information and calculator and cell phone within their brain. They would be extremely powerful individuals. And that's the ethical problem, because who's going to get it? Does the government decide to give it to their, you know, their SEAL team or whatever? Um, or should it be available to everybody? And I think absolutely it should be available to everybody. It's an enhancement that uh, will eventually come, I believe, and, uh, but it must be democratically widely available, uh, and not government funded to everybody, but people who need it and who can afford to get it, and hopefully the price will come down dramatically, they should, they should get it. But if it's restricted, it'd be ethically tremendously, uh, tremendously wrong, because you have this group of super people who would you know, blow away everybody else. They would just be it basically in command of the world. It is important and we will uh, continue to have it. It would be better if they could simplify the procedure and um, accept some more subjective opinions rather than having been very tight about everything. But you've got to have regulation. Um, and I suppose it would be best if, if the whole world had a, a similar type of regulation across the world so that you know, everybody, everywhere, uh, every device, I mean, would be regulated. I would say uh, go for it. Um, it is the future. Learn a lot of skills. Don't just do a course in biology. Don't just be a neurosurgeon to a physician to a basic research scientist, be an engineer, be an engineer in electronics, engineer in hardware and software, be as widely knowledgeable as you can. And uh, it'll take you a lot longer to get to that point, but you'll find it'll be well worthwhile in the end. If you narrow down, you'll just, you know, you'll eventually die off. So it'll be a wide tree trunk that can grow with many branches. interesting uh, path from, from, I always want to do research, all of us. So I went from getting my MD to a bit of surgery to a PhD with, um, in neurophysiology and anatomy, and then going on from there to um, looking at the question of long-term chronic recording and realizing that the way it's been done is not, it's not, I didn't think it was viable. Um, and then just stumble into, you know, wanting to do chronic recording, then just sort of stumble on into, I guess, what you might call BCI or development of neuroprosthetics, and just took it from there. My best memory <clears throat> is when a patient we called JR, uh, he was implanted in the brain with electrode, and we're using his, the signals from his brain on a spelling task. And one day we were training him to, um, well, there are two memories, but this first one is most important. <clears throat> we were training him to spell his name. And uh, this was published in 2002. And he spelled his name, and he didn't do very well. He had the whole 10 letters in a row. There was a J, an O, an H, and an N in there. His name was John. And he's tried again, and he had about six letters. He improved. He tried again. I think he had just one error, and that was great. And each time we give him a rest, and we gave him a rest, so let's try again. And then he went totally wrong. He started to put in a P. It was supposed to be a J O H N. He'd always start with a J, and then he did P H I L. He spelled my name, right? Just totally went off. And we thought, Johnny, what are you doing? 
okay, so my name, he spelled Melody's name, he spelled Kim name, Kim's name, he, spent, he spelled John Goldthwaite. He spelled Goldthwaite, which is very difficult to spell, and he almost got it right. And that was, that was a big day. And we looked at each other and said, wow. So we knew then that he was off on his own. The other time that was um, a big thrill again was, um, well, I guess there's one more after that, but again it was Johnny, and he, um, he was moving the cursor for us, and we asked him, he could blink and give us a yes or no answer, and we asked him, um, what are you thinking of when you move the cursor? And he spelt out N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing. So we said, okay, we'll see you later, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> we came back tomorrow, so we asked him again. And he spelled out that he was thinking of moving the cursor. He wasn't thinking of his hand. We didn't plant his hand area. And when he imagined moving his hand, he got some firing. But at this point in the training, he had switched to thinking of the cursor. And that was really important. It showed that the cortex, I guess, had embodied the cursor. It was now a cursor-related cortex. And the third one I have to mention is another um, ER, and um, I call Eric, because he doesn't mind his name being used. And um, we were training Eric to move the cursor essentially through a phoneme space. So as he moved the cursor, you heard these phonemes like, uh, then as he moved it, E or A uh, or U. Uh, and we gave him the task of moving it from U uh, to A, uh, U uh, to E. And he, when he did it, that day, that was a big day, because we knew exactly that we'd done it, and we knew that this technique would work to, to give a, produce a speech, uh, a, a speech prosthetic, so that in other words, it's, it's not with any sort of delay that you have to produce letters, but that we'd he'd be, actually be able to speak someday. Mm -hmm. That's quite a possibility. Mm -hmm. Especially if somebody is paralyzed and that cortex is just more or less dormant and, you know, as, uh, there's no other function intruding so that the function you then relegate to it will actually become dominant. Sure, I think that's uh, highly likely. Now imagine if you're trying to uh, control a very sophisticated artificial limb or two limbs or somebody walking. Um, absolutely, I think the cortex will become um, it will embody those artificial limbs. The Spanish, what's his name that stopped the ball in his tracks? All these... Delgado. Delgado, yep. yeah. I read about that and I'm very impressed. Um, at the same time, you know, it was iffy stuff, but it was very impressive. And then you had all these um, lobotomies back then that were... Walter um, Freeman and the lobotomobile. Yes. Yeah, that, that said, wow, that's terrible. <laughs> but it did show that you could change uh, personalities and actually um, change the outlook for somebody with delusions or schizophrenia. In fact, I once talked to a patient who, I mentioned the other night, that I talked to a patient who actually had one of those, had a lobotomy, uh, though I don't think it was through the eye socket. And she was very happy she did. She said she had this voice that was driving her, ruining her life, running her life, and it went away. And she was very glad she had it. It was 20 years later. So they weren't all terrible, and they're still, I think, done to a very limited extent. But anyway, just thinking about functional neurosurgery, reading about it really influenced me. And that's really what I wanted to do. That's, in fact, why I did a bit of neurosurgery. Um, and why now I know enough about that, I can, can converse with neurosurgeons. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure who greatly influenced my life, except everybody, I suppose. Well, I, the immediate goal, intermediate if you like, or maybe it's long term, is to develop a speech prosthetic. Um, and basically just push the field forward. I think that um, it, I'd like to be involved in this question of, of um, enhancing normal human function, because I think it's very important to do that in an in a ethical way. And I'd like to be involved in pushing that forward. I do. I'm actually very optimistic. Um, it, it, it's going to work. I mean, y you can never expect any progress to happen 
the way you plan it, or overnight, or even in a nice block of time, you say five years, and you might, oh, five years is a long time, and it goes by, and you still feel, oh, what did I really do? Well, whatever time it takes, it will happen, and technologies will come along that will sort of give us jumps ahead, like for example, computing has, and miniaturization, and uh, MEMS devices, all that, and the miniaturization of electronics, for example, which is now going to make it possible to have chronically implanted electronics to um, record from the electrodes and, on the other hand, drive electrodes and stimulate them. All those advances, they'll come from other areas, and it will go, it will move. So I'm extremely optimistic, despite, you know, a lot of kind of chit-chat and talks about pessimism and how difficult it is. I mean, if it was difficult and easy, we'd have done it long ago, so <laughs> I wouldn't worry about the difficulty at all. That's the fun, that's the challenge, as long as you don't take it like, oh, terribly seriously. No, it's the fun challenge.